We'll hear the discussion between now Double Line CEO and the Bond King himself, Jeffrey Dunlap. Hey, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining me. And before we get into you know the regulations and all of that kind of stuff, can you lay out to the audience what's happening and maybe what the media might be missing from this story? Well, uh, hedge funds analyze uh, stocks and they take aggressive positions. And a lot of hedge funds looked at uh, companies like GameStop and AMC Theaters, and they said that the fundamental case for these stocks is poor. And that's fine. And so they shorted the stocks. Um, where they kind of went crazy is they shorted the stocks to an alarming degree, so that in the case of GameStop, there was a 140% short position, which means when you short a stock, it, it's, it's selling. It puts pressure on the, on the stock price. Uh, and when you, when you borrow the shares, or when you're uh, short selling, you're borrowing the shares, if you short 140%, well, uh, it's going to be a problem if buyers emerge for whatever reason. In this case, thanks to primarily, I would say, governmental policy, there's uh, wherewithal among in investors, or if you want to call them that, or speculators, with government money being sprayed all over the place with checks to people that they have the wherewithal to put it together uh, into a real capital base. And in this case, there were 2.1 million people that somehow got organized on Reddit and managed to get about $20 billion of buying power. And so they found an opportunity to pile drive these hedge funds who, once the selling emerged, for, the buying emerged rather, for whatever reason, in this case, I think wherewithal from governmental stimulus, ultimately is really the cause. Mm -hmm. And there you see the buying emerges, and all of a sudden, these hedge funds that are short more than the entire amount of the stock outstanding have to scramble and buy the stock. And so you get this amazing spike. And uh, it's the hedge funds uh, can do what they want, but if they act imprudently, they will uh, so they will end up earning the right. uh, rewards, if you want to call it that, or in this case, the the problems of their activity. And so the, the, those investors uh, managed to uh, pull that off. How they were organized, I don't know. It's always interesting. One of my equity uh, analysts at Double Line said it's sort of like the wave at a, at a football stadium or a baseball <laughs> right, stadium. Right. You, don't, you, you don't know how it gets started. You know, if one guy stands up and starts doing the wave, probably doesn't catch on. But somehow it all of a sudden becomes a, a, a herding activity. And that's what happened here. I, I, th I think that. Um, this is getting a lot of attention because it was so dramatic in such a compressed time frame. But there's a lot of strange things that are going on. I mean, I mean, Tesla has been going up forever in a, in a virtually straight line. It's got a, a P.E. ratio of about 1,200. I mean, is, is, that, is that any weirder than GameStop uh, going up against a 140 percent short position? I don't think so. No, I so agree. anyway, that's kind, of, that's, kind of my, that's kind of my synopsis of what's happening. I have no sympathy whatsoever. For these hedge funds, I think to the extent that there was action taken to to shut down the, the short squeeze problem, I, I think that's wrong. Uh, and, and to that point, uh, you know, one of the guests made the, the observation earlier. You know, we talked about this organization, and by the way, for what it's worth, I have never been able to start one of those waves, and I've tried over and over again. Uh, but but. I stand oh, you've up. Done, and, you've done it with your show, Charles. You've started I, with your show. I stand up and throw my arms in the air, and everyone's like, "What the hell is wrong with that guy?" But yeah, <laughs> but 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 someone made a great point, and I want to get because I think this is a broader issue. I think there's the same undercurrent uh, that has driven global politics for the last few years, in the sense in the sense that the little person who's been left out, let down by institutions, uh, looked at these names specifically. And a lot of these are these COVID names, right? Maybe AMC would not be on the verge of bankruptcy if there wasn't COVID. So not only are they looking for the weakest in the herd, if you will, but the one that's been wounded, artificially wounded. Is there something in your mind that could possibly be uh, a noble fight, the little guy versus the big guy? Because I've seen on these chat rooms and these, and these message boards, Jeffrey, where a lot of people are saying, I bought two shares. I don't care if I lose it all. I just want to be in the fight. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Uh, unfortunately, there's a little bit of hubris that seems to be going on with this network, too, which makes me uh, l less likely to view them as kind of David versus Goliath. Uh, the hubris bothers me. But I think you're right. And in fact, I think your point 
is actually a uh, microcosm of a very substantial point, which is everywhere I look, I see uh, kind of different reflections of this kind of a theme that you're talking about, which is discontent, you know, wealth inequality, people being left behind. I mean, think of the poor people that were working on the Keystone Pipeline who all of a sudden got executive ordered out of a job. You know, pity the guy that's 50 years old and his whole life is built around that industry. And now what's he supposed to do? I guess, I guess, I, I think I heard they're supposed to become computer programmers <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 Which, which, yeah, I think, I think this is absolutely just one uh, chapter in a very long, tragic volume. Uh, that's what uh, I think it was Henry Clay said about the compromise of, of 1830. Uh, he said, this is the, the, the opening chapter in a great tragic volume. And this isn't the opening chapter. This book has been starting to be written since about 1982. And certainly it's accelerated starting in 1995, which is uh, this massive wealth inequality problem and people realizing that their opportunity set is uh, not where, where it should be, I suppose. And yeah, so they, no, no wonder they want to lash out and, uh, you know, you know right. take it to the man. Right. Well, the right. hubris part... <laughs> goes both ways because, you know, these hedge funds, brokerages, they also have been sort of lashing out, if you will, against their, their retail investor personally uh, in the media and, of, of course, online. I want you to take a listen, share this with you in the audience. Interactive brokers, Thomas Pettifree, someone I like, by the way, and I like hedge fund billionaire Leon Cooperman. They've both been on the show, but let's listen to what they've had to say in the last 24 hours. Both of those gentlemen are, they came, they pulled themselves up in the bootstraps. They weren't born wealthy. They're incredible philanthropists. But those kind of comments are so tone deaf, I think they stoke any kind of the, the animosity, the angst that you just described that's been building for a couple of decades. That throws kerosene on it, Jeff. It does indeed. You know, um, this concept that you're that you have a, a set of rules and that the rules are in place and people are playing by the rules and then all of a sudden the rules get changed. Uh, there's always uh, outrage when that happens, and yet it's been happening with increasing regularity for a long time. I mean, back in the global financial crisis in 2008 or so, uh, they broke the contracts that mortgage-backed securities investors were relying upon. You're not allowed to, to just modify mortgages by the prospectuses and by the terms of these things, but it happened. Now, uh, in 2020, you know, the Federal Reserve is governed by a charter. It's called the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And in that charter, it says the Federal Reserve cannot buy corporate bonds, certainly not low-grade corporate bonds. But guess what happened in April and late March of 2020? They, threw, they just tore that up, and they started buying corporate bonds. And, uh, you know, these, the rules change constantly, unfortunately. And it's, a, it's, it's always in response to some sort of fight, if you want to call it that, or societal unrest, or some, some viewpoint that some wrong has been done and so the rules uh, shouldn't apply. And in this case, uh, it, 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 I don't see what's wrong with hedge funds losing money. I don't see what's wrong with hedge funds going out of business. It's, it's kind of the business model of a hedge fund, actually, is take a ton of risk, and hopefully you're right. 90% of the time, and then 10% of the time, you're taking a risk in not all hedge funds. I'm not saying this for all sure. hedge funds, but sure. certainly at any moment in time, there are hedge funds that are taking very large risks. They're taking a one-sided bet, and they understand, or they should understand, that if that bet pays off, they're going to become very wealthy, which many hedge fund managers have become. And if that bet uh, turns out to be in the wrong spot, well, they go bankrupt. And the, the history of hedge funds is the history of bankruptcies. Uh, one, once you do an analysis of how many hedge funds that were around 20 years ago are still around today, it's a very small number, I can assure you. One of the things that's always misleading about hedge fund returns is there's a series that they, uh, people use that put together a, co a composite of hedge fund uh, returns by you know, having many managers in there, and they always look really good because the ones that go bankrupt fall out. So the 10-year return looks great because the ones that went bankrupt six right. years ago aren't in there. It's what we call a survivor bias, and it's extremely significant in hedge funds. So I, it seems weird to me that anybody would be uh, crying crocodile tears before hedge funds losing money by shorting 140% of GameStop. I, I mean, 
you, you, that's what they signed up for. Yeah, and, but I got to tell you, all week long, I've you know, the, I'm toggling all the different financial channels, and the overarching narrative is that somehow, you know, this is unfair to the hedge funds, or, uh, you know, that that uh, that the, the individual investor is going to be left holding the bag. And I think that's, I think that that species. I don't know that. Listen, last last year, S and P 500, 40 percent of the stocks in the S and P 500 finished down for the year, an average of 17 percent. The 20 worst losers were down 47 percent on average. I mean, people take risk in the market. Certainly, there's heightened risk at, at GameStop at a 300. Uh, but there's also people should be allowed to be adults. And when I hear these folks lashing out uh, as they're under some pressure, I, I just think they do, they're doing themselves a major disservice. You know, Jeffrey, one of the things I've been focused on is the, the, the push-pull in our country on capitalism. There's an amazing wave, a seismic wave right now that wants to up in our capitalistic system. Now, young people don't necessarily want socialism, but too many people believe the system doesn't work for them. How do we change that? You need a new system. Um, this is a really big issue, Charles, and it's one that I've been talking about for a long time. And that is that with the innovation of technology, which happens at times throughout human history very rapidly, you get a tension between the spoils of that technological development and kind of the the property relations. So the means of production, this is, I'm, I'm quoting Karl Marx of all people, which a lot of people, you know, they, 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 they break out in hives if you talk about Karl Marx, if they think they're capitalists. But Karl Marx wasn't even a communist, believe it or not. He was a political philosopher. And one thing he wanted to look into was why human history is loaded with episodes of tension and ultimate, ultimately large societal change. And it's because the property relations which is who gets the spoils of the economy and how we have rules and institutions to work together, they are very slow to evolve. Um, it's because the people who benefit from the property relations don't want them to change. I mean, if you're, if you're a winner in the property relations, you are going to resist evolution because the evolution will be negative for you. But then this revolutionary uh, change in the means of production, like social media, for example, uh, it can become, it, it, it can happen with extreme rapidity at a very large level of change. And the tension develops. And you can see that. And it, this is, this happens through history. And it's been happening. Uh, there's a book I would recommend all of your re, uh, watchers and viewers look into. It's called The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe, H O W E. He had a co author whose name, I am uh, embarrassed to say I don't re recollect, but it talks about how this happens. And this is what's happening right now. The people who have, have been left behind are getting more and more desperate. Right. And the more desperate they become, the greater the tension becomes. So the answer, Charles, and people don't like to hear this because people like to think that the genie can go back in the bottle with a small you know, uh, tuning up of the carburetor is going to change make the engine run perfectly again. That's not going to happen. What we need is a change in the institutions. And that is never, it's never pretty. It's a messy process. And it's obvious that it's been underway. Certainly Donald Trump was an obvious um, result of that. And I've been saying, you know, you, you know, Charles, I predicted before the primaries even started in 2016 yes. that Trump was going to win. Yes. And, and uh, he definitely won. And he certainly shook things up. But when I said in 2016, I said, if you think this year is a wacky election, 2016, wait till 2020. Right. But I, I, I'm going I'm to call that a correct prediction. And now what I've been saying in 2020 and now 2021, if you thought 2020 was weird, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because 2024 is going to make uh, 2020 look very calm and normal by comparison. Because I believe we're going to get further divisiveness and we're probably going to get to the point where we really have a three-party election. I, I, I thought that was possible in 2020, but I think it's downright likely for 2024. And why would you get a third party? Well, people want a voice. They want. Sure. They don't like what's happening. Well, uh, look, look at what's happening here in California. Gavin Newsom is now opening up the economy because he's scared to death that the signatures are about to be reached for the recall. And I would bet dollars to donuts that Gavin Newsom is going to be recalled. So this is all part of the same—it's it's all the same thing, but we're viewing it through different uh, lenses of the prison. 
So you, you, no. you gave us a lot of great stuff. So let me help. Let me go back a little bit here. By the way, in my notes, it says you told your staff in August of 2015 that Donald Trump would win. So you were way ahead of the curve. And, and it's because of these I things. Also, I also predicted, Charles, this is amazing, because I thought I thought I was being facetious at the time. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we start, got to a point where people started talking about renaming uh, institutions, like maybe the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, which has been renamed, or the Washington Monument. Yeah. I mean, that, that could happen. Yeah. So all of these things are, are part of the same movement. They're just, they're just you know, lashing out in, in, in different venues. So let's get back to this notion then, because you look at, I look at these Gallup polls and I see every one of these institutions that you described have dropped dramatically in the last 40 or 50 years in terms of how the public perceives them. The only one that's gone up is the U.S. military. So I'm with you there. But if, if the folks who are in the charge of those institutions, or you know, in, in this case, largely the billionaires who have the ability to make donations and, and, and control the narrative, if they push back every time, every time there's a ripple, their response is to diss someone for getting a check from the government and how dare they put it into a brokerage account, then I think we're going to get to this place you're talking about a lot sooner than 2024. Now, you have someone like an Andrew Yang who's saying, OK, you know, capitalism, if you could be a Luddite, net Lud, you, you railed against uh, the, the evolution, you, don't, you thought it was going to put people out of business. Turns out whether you think this is the third or fourth industrial revolution, every time before this, we ended up with net production. People ended up getting jobs and better lives. It's hard to see that right now when I saw something on local news here the other day where a machine, a robot, was taking all the plastics out of the conveyor belt, uh, you know, and, and separating them for, for, you know, in the system, whereas be right now they have about 100 people doing that. You start to take 100 jobs here, 500 jobs there, you throw in policy like the Keystone Pipeline where you deliberately take out 10,000 jobs. What is the solution? Universal basic income? Is it is it modern monetary theory? Is it a, is it an armed revolution? What is the solution? Ultimately, where are we going? Well, there were one of the most prescient uh, things that I ever saw was this animated movie. I think it was called Wall-E, and it contemplated a world in which everything was done by robots, and the people were just sit sitting around in like little pods being fed and just, you know, they had no purpose in life. And that's what you're kind of alluding to with this, uh, you know, uh, uh, technological change. I mean, when, automat when automated uh, vehicles come, you're going to put so many people out of work. In, in many parts of the country, you know, driving, you know, uh, driving trucks and so on and, you know, taxis and the like is a, is a, is a big thing. So what's when you say, are we going to modern monetary theory or are we going to helicopter money? Charles, we've been doing helicopter money on a limited basis since the 1960s. I mean, welfare is a limited program, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's well-intentioned, but it's meant to, it's, it's, it's free money. And we're doing free money. We did it. Uh, George W. Uh, George W. Bush did it in response to the global financial crisis, and we're now doing it. And nobody even takes uh, notice, really. I, I saw a headline yesterday: uh, Sacramento is going to send six hundred dollars uh, to a bunch of people if you make less than I think it's 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 pretty low. It's a pretty low threshold. I think it's thirty thousand dollars. If you make more than that, you don't get any money. But if you get, we're already doing it. Uh, right. We're already talking about another fourteen hundred dollars. It's just a question of, of how big it becomes. And so, what I what here, here's here's the bottom line, Charles. We have one hundred and fifty-seven trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities in the United States between the federal government, the consumer, and corporations. One hundred fifty-seven trillion dollars. That's seven and seven hundred fifty percent of GDP. We're running a 20 percent budget deficit right now. The government tells you it's 15 percent of GDP, but it's actually 20 because they conveniently leave off about a trillion dollars because they claim it's a one-timer sure. or something, but sure. it, it, it recurs, OK? So that, that's the scheme we're running. You cannot pay back $157 trillion. Uh, over, three, over three generations, it would be a depression of 10 percent of GDP every single year for three generations to try to pay that back in, in real money. So that's not going to happen. So there are two choices. You say, what's, what's coming? There are two choices. We only have the two doors. We have to restructure our liabilities, which means raising the age on entitlements and needs-based testing entitlements, and in general, belt tightening around 
around every aspect, or else we need to debase these liabilities yeah, but, through yeah, inflation. But, but, but Jeff, that's my that's the rub. So there are there will be a swath of folks though who are going to become very very wealthy off the electric vehicle uh, implementation, solar, wherever we go. Uh, and, 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 and some of these jobs become permanently lost. And so these, these, these people, you're saying, hey, you're going to have to tighten your belt, you're going to have to work longer, uh, and they're going to look across and they're going to see someone in a flying limousine <laughs> going over their heads yep. and, they're, and they're living week to week. And, and, and so you just wonder, and, and listen, I, I, it's so funny because we're talking about this automation. Arthur, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke saying that, you know, they, to the world, that Wally world you talked about, that they actually... Futurists at one point wanted us to have that world because they said, as humans, we use maybe a, less than a tenth of our brain and we could pursue things more noble. But I think what Americans want, what human beings want, is a noble, the ability to raise themselves up by the bootstraps to feed their Absolutely. families. They want goals. Right. That's what's noble, not sitting in a grassy field thinking. So, but but right. we can't avoid these things. And uh, this what's happening this week with Robin Hood with the arrogance of some of these hedge funds, with the financial media circling the, the wagons around the richest folks in the, in the world, with, the regular, with Robin Hood doing the same thing, it has made all of the things that you have been predicting even worse. And, 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 and now we're grappling for solutions. Can we trust Congress? Can we trust any political party to come up with them? Doesn't look like it. I mean, what, what, what the average Joe, like I, I come from very... Uh, I was a lower middle class person. My brother, who has owns his house without a mortgage, has over a million dollars in savings. He swings a hammer. Okay, it's self actualization. That's what people want. They want to feel fulfilled. They want to have a, 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 a purpose. They want. They have passions. And they want to fulfill them. What the little guy is seeing is that time and time again, you called it circling the wagons. The wagons keep getting circled in favor of an ever narrow set of, I will call them, elitists. And what's happened with the 2020 election is, to a large measure, it's the last gasp of the elitists, I think. They've got their, they brought the, the band back together. I mean, can you actually believe that, who, you know, that, that John <laughs> Kerry is back? I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, really? And, 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 and they think the answer to all the, all the uh, difficulties we're having is that we go back and make friends again with the other elitists in the world. And we have all these people that are getting rich off of the radical change in the means of production. Well, they're getting rich and they're, they're not really um, operating in a way that is helpful. And this right. is the Donald Trump for America. I mean, did you, did you notice that the United States trade deficit has exploded in the pandemic? It was actually shrinking gradually. Right. And now it's exploded. Right. China now has... Right their highest trade surplus with the United States of all time, I believe. And that isn't a coincidence. That's, that's happening as, as uh, the, you know, the band is being brought back together, so to speak. Yeah. And the little guy is being bought off. I mean, let's just go back to welfare and the $2,000 checks. It's sort of like, look, we're going to make a, a bargain with you. You don't have any opportunity. Your job is gone, Mr. Keystone Pipeline Worker. But here's two thousand dollars, and here's here's an old used sofa from the Salvation Army, and he, and, and here's a, a six pack Pabst Blue Ribbon. So be happy and shut up. And the little guy is not going to go along with that because there's too many little guys. I'm not a little guy uh, in terms of you know the structure of society, but philosophically I am, and I, I side with people who want to be self actualized who want to swing a hammer and make something for themselves right. and care about basic decency. And I, that seems to be lacking. And I think that's fundamentally what is bothering people. And it's just, you notice how uh, volatility keeps escalating. We can start with the VIX in the stock market. The VIX was below 10 for an incredible number of days in 2017. And people started to say we would never have volatility again. Well, you might notice that the volatility in the stock market keeps increasing. We had a bear market in 2018 in the fourth quarter. Then we had a massive rally. Then we had a massive crash bear market. Then we rallied back to new highs. Market's really struggling now. The VIX hasn't been below 20 right. since, the, since right. the pandemic came. My, I think we're looking at ever, ever uh, rising peaks, if you will, on a trend line basis in volatility, risk, 
and discord until such time as that fourth turning finally comes, that wonderful moment, as difficult as it will be, and we can find a way to structure the markets, our institutions, religious, social, governmental, in a way that is in sync with the way society can agree right. well, upon working together. And that's what's coming. It'll be a great day. But, you know, in you 1789, got, people were so angry that they that they uh, walked from Paris to Versailles in a massive uh, thunderstorm, rainstorm. Most of them probably got to leave it there. <laughs> we got to leave it there, so my much. friend. It was an amazing okay, conversation. Charles. I really appreciate it. Jeffrey Gunlack, please come back real soon.